Hi, I'm Joe Acker, and I'm the Director of Clinical and Professional Practice for BCHS. This pre-hospital obstetrical emergencies case rounds presentation was delivered in Prince George on October 19th, 2018. Unfortunately, our recording system missed the first few slides, so I'll provide them for you now, and then Dr. Devin Spooner will take over. Back in 2009, there were about 45,000 live births in British Columbia. 44,000 of them happened in the hospital, and about 1,000 out of hospital. Our latest data for BCHS in 2016 and 2017 demonstrates that we, see, we saw about 381 births in the field. And paramedics who were involved in those get stork pins. Vancouver Coastal awarded about 68 of those, in the North region around 8, and the other regions we didn't have data for at the time of this rounds presentation. Now, I think paramedics would normally get kind of nervous when they're responding to a delivery in progress, but fortunately in Canada, most deliveries are safe. The infant mortality rate is around 4.5 per thousand live births, that's death within a year. The early neonatal de death rate is around 2 per thousand live births. And the maternal mortality rate is around 7.8 out of 100,000 live births, more often thromboembolism than postpartum hemorrhage. Planned home births with midwives are becoming more common in the field, and BCHS has an operations policy for this that you might want to take a look at. Midwives will generally be involved in low-risk pregnancies. Anything that's high-risk should happen in a hospital. Midwives should be registered with CMBC and will generally have a birth attendant present with them to support them. It's important that the midwives have communicated with the hospitals or the physicians, and generally they'll do this through a prenatal form at 20 weeks and at 36 weeks and they'll often have contacted the receiving hospital in advance. If a paramedic is called to the scene, remember that collaboration and communication is really important. The midwives are the primary caregiver and the medical escort for the patient for delivery and for extended medication scope of practice as necessary. They're exceptional at neonatal resuscitation, and we can be there as paramedics to support them in that. If paramedics have been called by the midwives, it's because something unexpected has happened, and it's our job to provide care for other medical issues or maternal resuscitation if necessary within our scope of practice. We'll now move to the recording of the case presentation. The case is a 25-year-old female who's in labor. Dr. Spooner has asked the group, what do you want to know about the patient? The first response from one of the remote callers was that they wanted to know if the patient was pushing or had an urge to move her bowels. Could you hear her okay? Yes, I could hear, uh, hear the doctor just fine. Thanks. Okay, yeah, we've got only one micro, we've only got one microphone here, so just, if you can't, please ask us to repeat it. And uh, I'm sorry, can you uh, hear us or uh, see us okay? Yeah, yeah, we can, thank you. Okay. So, how many babies, singleton or multiple gestation? Yeah, question here in Prince George was was how how many babies? Obviously, mm -hmm. are there are there, is there multiple gestations or not? And that's very important. Hi, uh, Dr. Spooner from St. Paul's. I'd like to know kind of a brief overview of of the gestation in itself, if if it was uh, any uh, complications that she was expecting or if it was trending to be just a normal birth. Yeah. And what sort of, you know, I guess the question, yeah, what, what sort of complications might you be most concerned about? What, 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 might, uh, what might signify um, uh, the woman have, requiring a C-section versus uh, attempting a vaginal delivery? But he needs to mute. Yeah. If they're presented preview. Yeah. We had, to, uh, sorry, there's somebody that's got their mute off their phone. If you can, if you can turn your mute on. Uh, we had here in Prince George a placenta previa. So that will be, yes, absolutely a contraindication to vaginal birth. Um, and pr presentation may be, may be bleeding. Um, and so a C-section is required for that. So you wouldn't want to attempt a delivery in out of hospital. Prolapse cord would also. Prolapse cord? Yeah. 
that would be important. They probably, on history, that would be something, well, they might know. I guess they might feel the court, I suppose. They, they, uh, but usually you'd, on physical exam, that would be something that would be picked up, but absolutely something you're looking for. Was there a previous birth by cesarean? Are they trying to do a VBAC? Um, also, just the typical, um, how many pregnancies, how many live births, that type of thing. Exactly. So the more births she's had, the more likely the labor is going to be short. Or has she had a history of short labors in the past? Addressing that question about cord prolapse, probably what you'd want to ask more is, are your membranes intact? Have your membranes ruptured? Because you're not going to get a cord prolapse if her membranes are intact. Uh, the thing I like to ask is, um, after I know her gravita, whether this is her first pregnancy or not, is if she's had a previous vaginal deliveries, how fast was her last vaginal delivery? And that helps me to gauge how quickly things are going to happen here. Okay, so I think, is there any other questions? I guess prenatal care is something that we would want to know. Like it's one of the common questions I would ask is if they had any prenatal care. Uh, being from Fort St. James and, and servicing a lot of the outlying communities, quite often they don't. So you, it's really a big surprise. Uh, yeah. What's coming? What's coming? So even here, even here. Yeah. Yeah. So prenatal care. Has a woman had any prenatal care? And that's that's very important because it it, it may make the the due date, uh, the gestational age unknown. Um, the, the, what sort of medical problems they have? Um, do they have twins? You don't. None of that is known. The other thing is, if she's had a recent ultrasound, you might want to ask her, was the baby head down in the last ultrasound that you had? Um, and when was that ultrasound? Because if it was at 20 weeks, well, then we don't know whether it's going to be vertex or breach. But if she's had one in two weeks and she's 37 weeks, then probably it's still the same presentation. I think the timing of contractions she's current if she's currently having them would be big for our transport decision or not yeah so if the contractions what sort of timing on the contractions make you make you nervous make you more worried about an imminent delivery uh, with two minutes or less during the contractions might be signifying an imminent birth and you might have to set up on scene if they're farther apart we could look to transport at that time correct and the length of the contraction i guess is probably important as well the duration the duration yeah, yeah when they started right when the contractions started how long are the contractions are they regular irregular yeah absolutely and then uh, there was a question that came in by email was uh, any complications associated with the uh uh, with the pregnancy, I assume. So uh, complications such as what kind of complications? Hypertension, gestational diabetes. Yeah. Any meds that she might be on for the hypertension? Is yeah. she on insulin for the diabetes? Yeah, ge so gestational-related uh, disease. All right, and I think we've touched on these, the, the focus maternal history that we definitely want to know about is how many previous deliveries, and we mentioned this, uh, labor is going to be uh, longer if there's a first-time mother, if they're not leprous. Um, does she feel the need to push, whether that's rectal pressure or pushing, or um, that's, that suggests the delivery is imminent? And then any, any conditions that preclude hospital delivery? Um, and we've talked about these as well. Placenta previa, transverse presentation, breech presentation, um, or multiple gestations. All right. So for this patient, she's had gravita four. So just to remind everyone, the uh, notation system, that's the number of pregnancies in the past. Um, you put, and then the T is term. So those pregnancies that went over 37 weeks. Um, were there any preterm deliveries? Um, less than 37 weeks. How many live infants, how many live births did she have? So three on, in this scenario. And how many... Uh, what we term abortions, which just means the number of pregnancies lost before 20 weeks, um, whether those are miscarriages, where, whether those were therapeutic uh, abortions, um, or whether, and uh, so that's what that signifies. 
So her, she's feeling the urge to push. She's got contractions two minutes apart. So, uh, and she doesn't have anything in her history that suggests she, she can't perform a pre-hospital birth. So your 15 minutes transport to the hospital is, what are you gonna do? We're gonna stay and deliver. We'll see if it's, because it's happening. It sounds like it's happening, right? I'll examine see if there's groaning. Yeah. And yeah. make my decision. Yeah. What are groaning? If, if she's directions there, but you know, baby's groaning and then between directions, there's the seeds, then I will deliver at the scene. Yeah. However, if if there does a seed, that means to me I will transport only 15 minutes, go through. If you don't see any bulging or any yes. cr crowning or anything, yeah. So correct. I mean, just remind everyone, of obviously, physical exam, ABCs. We're still going to worry about her airway, breathing, circulation. She's up talking. She's, her, her vitals are stable. Um, she's not having bleeding. Um, so we're going to do a focused examination, examining her, the, the fundal height, make sure that, the, you know, and uh, uh, if you, do you have tape measures? No. No. So basically, uh, I mean, if you're, if you're checking, I mean, full, Full gravid uterus is up by the xiphoid. Is there a is there a good landmark they can use if they don't have a? Um, I, I, you know, I mean, I think in this scenario, if she's this scenario, I would obvious. I wouldn't measure fundal height. The only thing I, if you're going to put your hands on the abdomen, I try and see whether the baby's head down or if it's a breach. Yeah. I mean, in this scenario, because that's what you want to know, right? If you're bulging at the perineum and you can't see anything, but it's bulging, you can you don't know if that's head or bum. So if you're going to use any um, clinical assessment at the bedside and put your hands on the abdomen, what you want to know is, and I don't know how old, you know, is this down at the bottom above the pubic symphysis, is that head I'm feeling or is that bum? And what's at the fundus? Don't yeah. bother measuring fundal height. And if you've, I mean, I, I assume uh, this is a question out to the paramedics. Is there any training in doing Leopold's maneuver, like trying to see which way the baby is head down nope. versus breech? No. I assume that's not part of generally part of the training so it'd be because uh, you don't do vaginal exams which is yeah. why because she can't do any invasive examinations probably that would be a useful clinical assessment tool to have and you don't have to do the full leopold's maneuver but just you know the first step which is what's presenting yeah and that would be the super pubic portion would that be the easiest way to determine its vertex? so you do both you do feel at the just above the pubic symphysis to see what you think that is down there, and and then at the fundus to confirm your findings. Yeah. So it makes sense. Okay. So. I have a question. Okay. Go go ahead. There's a lot of feedback there. Static. All right. This is uh, from St. Paul. Um, so in, uh, in reference to what the doctor was just describing there, um, I, I don't know what to, what to expect to feel. And can you maybe like describe that a little bit more so that I can know what I'm looking for when I'm examining the abdomen? I think initially your first maneuver should be putting your, your hands above the pubic symphysis and feeling really you're looking at the consistency of what the, that, that whatever part of the baby is there. And usually the head will be a lot harder than the bum. And, and so that's the best you can go on, right? Um, and then asking her if, like I said, if she's had an ultrasound within the last two weeks, what the presentation of the baby was on ultrasound. It is tricky, I get it, if you don't do it all the time. Well, I, I would certainly speak for myself. I don't examine full-term pregnant women rarely in my Leopold's maneuver. Uh, I think accuracy would be point yeah. lacking, so I, don't, I wouldn't expect paramedics to also yeah. have that. But if there is an easy way to, I, I mean, if there is a, a, a solid physical exam finding, like feeling the head, that it... Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's certainly, there's no harm in doing it, put yeah. it that way. You're not going to hurt anything. And you might be able to say, yeah, you know what I feeling at, I'm feeling at the fundus is certainly not as firm as what I'm feeling over the pubic symphysis. And that's the best you can do. Because we, we would do then combine that information with a vaginal exam 
to confirm what actually is presenting, but I know that you guys don't do that. I think that's something you can build into your personal practice. So if you're moving the non-imminent delivery yeah. with consent, ask, you, can I feel where it is? Do you know where the baby's lying? Yeah. Or follow up with the physician afterwards and say, was the head engaged? You know, I felt the spine, it felt softer up here than down here. And then yeah. you can slowly develop your skills. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point is practicing, practicing your uh, physical exam uh, in appropriate situations. Obviously, if it's a stub toe, it's probably not the time to do a, uh, a maternal um, uh, an examination of the of the uh, of, of the uterus. But um, certainly, uh, if if it's uh, involving a pregnant woman and and uh, or any patient um, practicing those exams are that's it's crucial. That's the only way you get good at at your physical exam. Okay, so. This is obviously in this in this picture here. We've got um, uh, we've got a, uh, not only a bulging perineum, but you can actually the crowning is happening. So the the baby's head there, you can you can easily see. Um, and uh, and if not, if you if you wait for a contraction, you may see this where the baby comes down during the contraction. So obviously uh, examining, but examining if you don't see anything, examining through a contraction as well to get a better sense of how close they are. All right, so our patient, we've got, uh, we've got a 25-year-old. She's got the urge to push. She's crowning. Um, so I think, I think we're all in agreement. We're going to deliver this patient based on that physical exam and history. Um, other questions uh, uh, to consider there? We talked about delivery date, but just to remind you that if it sounds like this patient is, uh, this baby is preterm, that you're more likely to have to do what? Resuscitation, yeah. So just to have your resuscitation equipment or to call for, if you haven't already called for backup, um, certainly would, would want to at this point. Um, and we'll, what color is the amniotic fluid? Is there meconium present? Um, and meconium aspiration is a concern, although there have been some changes over the years as far as how we um, manage and deal with, with meconium. So, are there any questions? I think there was one here. Somebody sent in a question. Oh, it's going to come up on that. All right. So, yeah, just to, okay, it comes up here. So, so once the baby's head is delivered but the shoulders aren't out, um, you know, in the past, often if there was meconium, you would suction at this point at the perineum, but this is no longer recommended. Um, so just, just, to, just to remember that change if you've, if you've done a delivery in the past. Is there a question? No, someone just have to mute your phone. Oh, I have a question. So oh, yeah. What is the reason behind it? Can instruction anymore? Even the secretion and babies. There's uh, complications with suctioning. Uh, it can cause the babies to, to uh, bradycardia. It can cause hypoxia, bradycardia, and it can also cause trauma if you're using the the bulb, the hard bulb. It can actually cause bleeding and uh, trauma, so that's kind of why it's, it's gone away. And it hasn't been shown to reduce the risk of meconium aspiration syndrome or any, anything like that. So if it, if it doesn't and it delays things, because it's one more, if you can imagine, in the middle of this, you're suddenly now doing a procedure. It, it's kind of one more step, mm -hmm. one more thing you need to do that may interfere with uh, the actual delivery. It's not really, um, it's, re yeah, it's definitely bradycardia. Because the baby is not going to become hypoxic, because when the head's out, the body's still in. It's not breathing yet. It can't do that until it's delivered, and then it takes its breath. It's also still getting its blood supply right from the placenta. The cord attacked. Can I just make a comment about our suctions? Yeah. So our suctions are in fact adjustable, but very few people actually know how to adjust them, and the adjustment's not really easy to control. So if you find yourself delivering in the back of a car, number one, you're far better off using your portable suction because that is easier to control. The ones in the car, 
once you unscrew it enough to get it down to about 100, uh, that screw actually may pop right off because that's how loose, loose it is. Um, most of the current uh, delivery kits, the OBGYN kits that we carry, have been have had the bulb suctions taken out and replaced with the proper uh, suction catheter, but they're not all carried on car. And as I said, not everybody knows how to actually adjust the suction, so it, it might be a good point for a um, some kind of a memo to say if you don't know how to what the suction should be or how to adjust it, time to review. Yeah, they've got the new, the six French suction catheters included in this. Um, I was going to show this later on in the presentation. And um, yeah, you want it, you definitely want the suction below 100 um, to avoid any trauma. Okay. Uh, Joe's just mentioning they're going to take that back to learning um, how the adjustment of the suction in the cars. Um, so PPE, obviously, uh, giving birth, there's there's fluid, there can be blood, there can be meconium, and so you want to properly protect yourself uh, with mask. Uh, uh, eyewear, eye protection, and um, and and do you have a gown or anything that you can put on? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. yeah. it's not it's not included in the maternity kits. But you okay, good. Um, and then we'll talk about the maternity kits the specifics on that. Um, a warm environment, so to keep. If, if you can adjust the, if you're in a house or, or you're in an environment, adjust it to, uh, to warm it up to 22 to 26 degrees or the, or the ambulance if, uh, if you're in the ambulance. So uncomfortably warm because uh, the baby obviously is at risk for hypothermia. Um, and then as far as delivery position, um, you know, in this situation, this is a precipitous delivery. It's it's not a it's not a planned home birth. I mean, you maybe get called to a planned home birth, but it's un, unlikely because usually, usually those are um, dealt with by the, the midwife. But um, generally speaking, the lithotomy position would be the probably safest and, and easiest way to deliver. But there are other other positions that are uh, obviously um, uh, available and maybe advantageous in certain in certain circumstances. And we'll talk about those some of the emergencies where, uh, for example, a knee chest position might be might be advantageous. But generally speaking, lithotomy is is the way to go. Would you agree? Yeah, it's also you know hard to deliver a baby when she's squatting. I mean, you're you're basically on the floor doing it. So yeah, I agree. Lithotomy is the more straightforward position. And if you see this. Uh, the picture here, she's on a mattress, and there's lots of mattress underneath so that there's no concern about the actual fetus uh, a baby dropping. Okay, as we discussed, here's the maternity kits. Um, this one I'm showing is not vacuum packed, but most of them, at least over at uh, Station 531, where I just got another one, uh, are vacuum packed, vacuum sealed. Um, there's the six French soft catheter. And again, only used uh, if there's excessive meconium uh, or fluid and in the context of a flat, uh, uh, unresponsive uh, infant um, or uh, in, in not making effective respiratory um, effort after, after um, bagging. So it's, it's, not the, it's not like the past where it's been, that's been sort of done very quickly, either intrapartum or postpartum. Uh, where suction is brought out, this is this is further down the line, um, and uh, the neonatal warming bags are in in, uh, in the maternity kits as well. And there's four cord clamps uh, in case there's malfunction of one or two of the other ones. All right, so we're gonna. Is there any questions right now? We're gonna show a little two-minute video from the simulation lab. Uh, this is the simulation doll Noel, which is a, a, a low fidelity uh, mannequin, which uh, we will use later on to practice uh, some deliveries here in Prince George. Okay, there are going to be some situations where you're going to need to do a vaginal delivery. 
if the mom is telling you that the baby's coming, if she's pushing involuntarily, or you're seeing some bulging at the perineum, you're gonna need to prepare for that. So the best thing to do is to get her in a frog leg position on a solid surface. You've got a couple of blue pads in your bundle. You're going to put that underneath the mom. All right. And you're going to be sitting at the foot of the bed on her right side. Put your dominant hand on the perineum to support it. And your other hand you're going to put on the presenting part on the head. And that's so that you can control how fast that head is delivered to minimize maternal trauma. So I would just encourage her just to breathe or pant through the contractions rather than pushing so that the baby doesn't come out too quickly. So you're supporting the perineum as the baby's coming out. When the baby comes out, it's going to usually be looking on the floor, and then it's going to <coughs> rotate to align the head with where the back of the baby is. So it's just panting through these contractions because it's coming out quite quickly. So. Now the baby sets out, it's gonna turn naturally. You're gonna check for a cord, and if you feel a cord by sweeping from the base of the neck towards you, you're gonna pull <coughs> that cord and loop it over the baby's head. And she's gonna to continue to push with the contractions, just slow, like small pushes. And there you go, the baby's being delivered. And you're gonna deliver the baby in the downward and then upward direction following the pelvic curvature. We're gonna put the baby directly on mom's chest so they're skin to skin. You've got two towels in your bundle. So I'm gonna dry the baby well, including the head. Then you can get the other towel to put on the baby. And then we've got a cap that they lose a lot of heat from their head. And then we've got the blanket that we can put over both mom and baby to keep them warm. So at this point, now you can deal with these four. And you've got two. So you'll put two, like so, and, make sure, and then you clamp it. And in between, you're going to cut with your scissors. Um, you don't have a knitted cap like that in your bundle. <laughs> 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 Any questions? There's scissors in the kids still? Yeah, there is. In regards to delayed cord cutting, what is it for the paramedics guidelines? It's 60 seconds or just wondering it's, about that? It's, thir it's said 30 to 60 seconds is uh, what I think I saw there. So, yeah, I think there, there was a movement as far as in the last, I don't know, was it four or five years ago with the delayed, cord, delayed camping? cord camping, which was, what's the definition, like two, two or three minutes or five minutes? So, I believe it was two minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah. So when you say less a minute or less is still considered early cord clamping um, and delayed is two minutes. And studies are showing that there's really no benefit to delaying cord clamping beyond two minutes. Yeah, because I've seen 30 to 60 seconds as our guidelines, but the uh, national pediatric was always two minutes. So the important thing is, like, you're not, not to scramble to worry about doing the core. Just, you know, deliver the baby, get the baby on the chest and dry the baby, and, and then you can deal with the core. Whether that happens at 90 seconds or 60 seconds, doesn't really matter. But yeah, delay, you know, if you can wait 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, thank you. What is the, uh, what is the significance of the skin to skin as opposed to a, a, a swaddling after uh, stimulation? Well, there's uh, the bonding that's important, the immediate bonding, and then the warmth uh, for the baby other than a swaddling. And there's off the top of my head, I can't remember this, but there have been studies about the importance, uh, the benefits of immediate skin to skin. And then I guess breastfeeding uh, shortly thereafter for uh, postpartum. If the baby's hemorrhage. vigorous, yeah, it, for sure we we do that even in the um, in the operating room. We get the mom uh, skin to the baby on the mom's um, chest in the operating room while we're doing a C-section. 
Um, we don't do the breastfeeding there, but certainly if it's a vaginal delivery, um, they do encourage if the baby is vigorous and well to encourage um, breastfeeding because that induces oxytocin release, which helps with decrease the risk of PPH. And then no breastfeeding during C-section is because of the medications they've received for the general anesthetic? No, or is it the logistics. I mean, she's having surgery and the okay. anesthetist is there and it's just not uh, practical to do that at the time because there'd have to be a lot of people around to help her get the baby yeah. on the breast. And oh, I thought you said skin to skin on C-section. We do skin to skin, but we don't do breastfeeding oh. in the OR. Okay. Yeah, we've added the uh, plastic bags to the, the kids um, primarily for preemies. Yeah. But what's the law about in the pre hospital environment used routinely for a term baby? What do you think? Yeah, and, and I saw the in the um, the treatment guideline of that there was there was some I think uh, flexibility uh, as regarding that. If you're uncertain about the gestational age, uh, using those, I, I I mean personally I don't think there's a problem with with using those uh, for a term baby as well. There's no there's no complication. I mean it may it may I guess the concern might be is uh, there might be a little bit of um, a disagreement with the family or mother at the time if she's had other babies or if she's done a lot of reading mm -hmm. um, or she's just wants that skin to skin. So that could create an unnecessary conflict if you're not if you're not worried. Obviously, depends what environment you're in, um, but I don't see any downside to using those if uh, you need to. Yeah, I agree. I think it's just could be a lot of fumbling in an emergency situation. Like you don't need to be too preoccupied with a plastic bag, and like you know, the maternal perception might be a bit alarming and uh, sort of medicalizing it to something that's natural. Mm. And I know at uh, BC Women's and Children's, the big concern is that parents are bringing in newborns who are very cold, and that we should work harder to prevent heat loss. Uh, it's definitely effective. I'll tell you because. So when we do C-sections, we also, with the baby is vigorous at delivery, we do delayed cord clamping at C-section. Now, we do it at one minute. Like, we used to take the baby out, clamp, clamp, hand the baby over. We now wait a minute, which when you're in a surgery, a minute feels like an hour. But what we do then, you can imagine the baby's exposed, we're in a sterile field, we worry about heat loss for the baby. So some of us, we, we have a drape, the plastic drape where all the fluids go through, We'll just, once we get the baby out, we'll put the baby under the plastic drape with the head out and we'll be drying that. So that's one thing we do use. And so it's the same principle, right? And to minimize heat loss, so we'll be very quick to dry the baby very well. Some of us will just, we have two towels, we'll dry the baby well and uh, to minimize heat loss. And, and then we'll do that. So we do that as well at surgery. I mean, this is the definition of high risk, low occurrence uh, event. And Probably the right time to have a checklist. It probably could be just in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I know I, I always forget to do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Woo -hoo, baby's out. Yeah. Baby's out. Yeah. Yeah. All around yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Well, that's in reality what we do too. We're not doing the app girls out one minute. We right. have to remember what was it like at one minute. Yeah. Be an easy place to put a checklist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, so post-delivery of the baby, I think, I mean, we've talked about some of this, but clear mouth and nose of secretion, so wiping is preferred over suction, generally speaking, unless, again, you've got a flat baby that's not, that doesn't have good respiratory effort. Um, dry before being bundled. Obviously, you don't want to use a wet towel to, to um, wrap them in a wet towel. Um, and then also, of course, the, uh, uh, the bags, the neonatal bags that we talked about. Um, Stimulate them, and if the stimulation with the drying is not working, you can flick the soles uh, if the baby is not responding. Uh, we talked about cord clamping, um, 30 to 60 seconds, and then it, it should be at least like about four to five centimeters from the baby's umbilicus. Um, you just want to make sure that you, you know, you don't cut too close to the to the baby. You want to give a little bit of uh, room there. The other thing is in that bundle, there are four cord clamps, which when we opened it, we thought, why do we need four? And I think it's just so you have extra. Yeah. And it's not no sort of like a turkey if you clamp and it's, it's still You can't weak. open it anymore. Yeah. Once you've clamped but, it. But, but once you've clamped it, um, if it's still leaking, it needs a second clamp? Or it shouldn't leak. Yeah. Yeah, once you clamp Without it, it snaps. It won't. Clamp failure. Or yeah, so clamp failure. So, yeah, you could use the second one in case, yeah. 
freuen uns. Ja, ich hoffe, ja. Ja. Okay, and we talked about hypothermia prevention, just to remind everyone to keep your ambulance warm. Uh, the polyethylene bags are for preterm babies or if uncertain. Certainly if you use them on a baby, that would be fine. And, if, and certainly I, that's good feedback, Joe, is if, if, if BC Women's Hospital is saying that the babies are coming in too cold, then that's, that's important to know. Um, somewhere, somewhere like that, that probably sees a lot more of these kind of unplanned yeah, it then. doesn't take much to get the baby cold because even for us, some of the patients were saying that when we were handing them the baby at C-section, some of the depend, you know, had to talk about our technique and what we were going to do um, to decrease that happening. And it's improved by us being away, you know, drying the baby vigorously, having more towels on our table, or putting the baby in the bag. I guess. Yeah. Okay. And then, of course, the other option we talked about is stay with the mother, skin to skin, breastfeeding, and keeping them warm. There's just a, a picture of, of the neonatal warming bags, not our particular warming bags, but uh, other ones that are available. Um, all right. And now, uh, remember, uh, we've got the third stage of labor. We've got to deliver the placenta. Um, and so patients, the bleeding starts. Uh, what's the definition of a postpartum hemorrhage? In other words, how much blood is, is a reasonable amount to have after a vaginal delivery? Um, and, and then when do we call it a, a postpartum hemorrhage? <laughs> it's 500 mils, 500 cc's, so just quite a bit. Um, but trying to quantify that, obviously, it can be difficult, but it's, if you keep an eye on it, if you're there and, and you, uh, you have towels, you can hopefully try and quantify it. Yeah. If, if just a reminder to mute, if you're not uh, asking a question, thank you. Okay. And what are three signs of placental separation? Well, the cold start coming out. Yeah. So inside. Yeah. So they, if there's lengthening of the uh, umbilical cord, that's one sign of separation. Bleeding. More bleeding. Yeah. yeah. See a gush of blood. Gush of blood. And then the other one is the the fundus of the uterus becomes fir quite firm as it contracts. The uterus contracts. All right, and then uh, the placenta, the actual removal of the placenta, either it can be done by maternal expulsion, um, and you'll note that the, the uterus is, is, will become firmly uh, contracted at that point. Um, and you can, you can do gentle cord traction uh, with uterine counter traction. Again, gentle is the, the operative word there because, of course, avulsion of the, of the cord is possible and you may end up with a, a worsening uh, uh, postpartum hemorrhage um, or you can get uterine inversion even worse so the placenta isn't completely detached from the uterus and the whole uterus kind of inside out. And that's particularly a risk factor with the deliveries you may be doing, which are precipitous, because the, that increases the risk that you can get uterine inversion where the uterus goes inside out. And so you have to be aware that not to pull too hard because you can cause that to happen as well as uh, evulsion of the cord. When, where, when do you assist and when do you not assist in that? With the delivery of the placenta, yeah. so most most placentas will be delivered within about ten minutes, and so she's still going to be having contractions. So once you see those signs of placental separation, you're going to put your non-dominant hand on the pubic symphysis to support the lower uterine segment and prevent inversion. You're going to do constant gentle cord traction, and you just get her to push when she's contracting. Um, but you have up till thirty minutes for a placenta to be delivered before it's considered retained. 
Of course, once you get to the 30-minute mark or beyond, the risk of a postpartum hemorrhage is six times higher compared to a placenta that's delivered within the first 10 minutes. So, yeah, you don't, I don't think you need to feel like you're under some huge time pressure. And you're going to get her to push when she's contracting. So just had a couple of emails, uh, comment and a question. Just if you can, just a reminder to mute if someone's calling in. Um, and then the other, uh, uh, the other question was about the, um, uh, the imminent delivery treatment guidelines is under critical care guidelines. And it's a good review on uh, the way to delivery, to deliver. Are people delivering placentas on scene? Or are you guys loading up and just kind of let it happen as we're going in? Did about a year and a half ago, and we just waited on scene. But it, again, we got back to the we waited uh, probably 10 minutes and nothing was happening. And I just wrapped the cord in my hand and just gentle traction. And I, could, I actually felt it go pop. And then the placenta delivered because we were we couldn't get we had to get her down on a chair cot because it was in a really narrow upstairs not happen in any other way kind of scenario. So and it worked fine. And there is the bags, the white bags that are for the placenta as opposed to the clear bags for the neonatal. A lot of bags in there. <laughs> All right, so she's now she's got more bleeding, heavy bleeding, more than 500 mils. Um, she's starting to feel a bit faint. What are you going to do for her? Well, we can lower the legs and start IV line because she's, she's quite a hemorrhagic and all. Okay. She's in lots of blood. Yeah, so we're going to start an intravenous line. That's, that's a good start. Anything else? Clear flat. Layer, position. layer flat, yeah, if she's not already flat, yeah, certainly taking advantage of that. You can do a uterine massage to encourage uh, the bleeding to stop. Yeah, uterine massage. Transabdominal, there's, uh, um, because in hospital it's done both endovaginal mm -hmm. and uh, transabdominal. Yeah, I the think. Uterine massage. Yeah, for me, as an officer, the first thing I would do, and, you know, you, you do your ABCs, but, yeah, absolutely, you have to massage the fundus of the uterus and just keep massaging it, and, and then because it, probably it's boggy or soft yeah. and it's not contracted, and it will respond to manual stimulation and it will contract, and you want to make sure it stays contracted. Um, and then, you know, you like you said, you start your IV and resuscitations. Um, when... What we do, in addition to doing that, is we do a bimanual uh, massage. So I would put my dominant hand in the vagina and get the uterus between my two hands, and I'm massaging that way. But for you, you would just be doing at the fundus. And it's okay for us to do that now because it's sort of been in and out of vogue many times over the years where it says, yeah, you can do it. No, you can't. Yeah, you can. No, you can't. I think the key so is not to... When you do it. You can't yeah. do it before the placenta is delivered. Right. You do it after, after the placenta is delivered. And not to spend more than like a minute right. doing it, because at, at that point, I think a minute is enough time for you to massage or like, I mean, yeah, I mean you obviously, if you have to do other things, I mean, I don't know how many people are at the scene, but for us, we were always having somebody massaging it while yeah. somebody's starting an IV or what have you. Or shouldn't delay, I guess my point is, shouldn't delay transport if you're doing the massage and yes, it's not happening. Correct. You don't want to wait 10 minutes before you transport, maybe start. You could do them both sure. simultaneously, yeah. continue the massage. Now, for our more advanced level uh, paramedics, so the critical care paramedics, uh, internal examinations, are they, is that something that they're, you're trained on, or is that? No. We were trained in Alberta, but we don't see any, we're not doing it. Yeah. So. Okay. I'm just curious. Just ITT or something? Yeah. I'm sure. Okay. And phone a friend for TXAVD. Phone, yeah, call EPOS for uh, IVTXA. It certainly can be used and it is used uh, definitely in other, it's, it's definitely used in, in Western countries, but particularly low, low resource countries because it's a relatively inexpensive um, medication to give for uh, postpartum hemorrhage and it's effective. And if it's easy to remember because it's just like trauma, it's within three hours 
um, of delivery. So if you have a postpartum hemorrhage, but it's uh, a late postpartum hemorrhage, so they delivered a week ago and now they're bleeding, it's, it's, uh, it's probably less effective. But the uh, bleeding that happens early postpartum is it's more of an effective so medication. Would be considered contraindicated for, let's say, primary care paramedics, where they say um, TXA is indicated in trauma only. That's the way, that's what we're teaching. I think it would be a call to EPOS is what I would what I would suggest. I, I wouldn't give it to every you know like no. every delivery that you do because it's one is is it, is it is there more bleeding than five hundred mils? Right. What's the current situation and and how far away are you from the hospital? Right. If it's um, you know, if you've got an hour transport time, then I certainly would be more uh, in, uh, inclined to, to uh, recommend it. But if you're if you're five minutes from the hospital, then you're and not likely going to even phone. I'm just going to yeah. diesel bolus. Yeah. yeah. But you know, really, in this scenario, the most common cause of we we talk about the four T's when we talk about postpartum hemorrhage. What what is it due to? It's due to tone. You know, it could be due to trauma, tissue, or thrombin. That's our, what we remember. But the number one cause is tone, poor tone. So this is why we, I was talking to Devin and saying, why do you not have misoprostol? Because what you need is an agent to improve uterine tone. And that's what you're doing by massaging the uterus to get it to firm up and contract. So when you give TXA, you're address, addressing the issue with a coagulopathy, right? You know, but really, the number one cause of a postpartum hemorrhage is not tissue. If the placenta is intact, you're not worried about retained tissue. You're probably not worried about laceration because it's been a precipitous vaginal delivery. What you're worried about is tone, the number one cause of PPH. So an agent that would help you improve that tone is would be really useful to have. And although you may not want to have oxytocin, um, misoprostol is another agent that we use to improve uterine tone. And it's tablets that you can put under the mom's tongue, sublingual. Mm. How is that classed, sorry, misoprostol? Category, you mean in pregnancy? <clears throat> yeah, is it like a hormone? Is it no, it's a urotonic agent, so it helps the uterus contract. Um, and actually, I got a, a text from the midwife, and the midwives actually carry quite a lot with them. <clears throat> so if you are with a, mid a mid midwife home delivery, she'll have oxytocin. She'll have ergometrin, she'll have hemabate, and I think they have also misoprostol. And all of those agents help the uterus to contract because, you know, that's what you're dealing with most likely in a postpartum hemorrhage. That's good to know. Talk about breastfeeding, uh, TXA, call EPOS. And um, I didn't know that the midwives had that, that other armatarium of medications too. And probably a pre-notification as well to your uh, receiving facility. Okay, so again, breach presentation, uh, uncommon or less common than vertex presentation. Certainly, um, oh, can you, Whoever's on, can you mute? Unless you have a question to ask. Um, you know, and so most breaches are, are delivered uh, via C-section. There are some, some facilities that do do, uh, will do a vaginal delivery of a breach. But generally speaking, in this um, at this time, most most will do a C-section. So if you have to decide between transporting to the nearest hospital and a a, a facility with advanced obstetrical services, you'd want to choose probably, if you have time, uh, the, the, that locate, the place that has the advanced uh, services. Uh, of course, if you have to deliver, if it's imminent, then, then uh, you have to deliver, just like our Vertex presentation, um, and pre-notify the hospital as well. So we'll, um, we've got another video here of a breach presentation. Okay, so I'm going to show you how to do a vaginal breech delivery. So the important thing to remember when you're doing this is not to pull at all on the baby and just allow it to descend naturally. Okay, so you're going to put your dominant hand on the perineum to support it and you're just going to allow her to push and allow that baby to come down naturally. Remember, do not pull. 
and putting my left hand on the sacrum of the baby as it's coming down. My right hand is supporting the perineum. Just let her continue pushing and let that baby descend. Now what you're going to do here is as the baby's being delivered, you want to make sure the baby's back is facing the ceiling. So when she's pushing, you're going to just gently rotate it so the back is towards the ceiling, but you're not going to be pulling. Now when you see the back of the knees, you're going to put a finger in the popliteal fossa and you're going to bend the knee and then allow it to extend like so. Same thing on the other side and then just let it dangle. She's going to continue to push and again you're going to just gently encourage that back to face the ceiling but you're not pulling. When you see the scapula is visible, you're going to grab the anterior, the arm Flex it at the antecubital fossa, sweep it over the chest, and then extend it and let it dangle. And same thing on the other side. And grab that other arm, flex up the antecubital fossa, and allow it to extend. And then what you're going to do is allow that baby to just dangle. You're not going to pull. It's unnerving, I know, but you're going to be close by so you can catch a baby if it drops. When you see the back of the neck and the hairline, you're going to put your non-dominant there. Your fingers are gonna go on the maxilla, not in the eyes, not in the mouth, on the maxilla. This is the morsel smelly bait technique. And if you see the cord here, you're gonna just gently pull on that so that it's not under any tension. Put your fingers over the maxilla so that and push at the back of the head here. So you're gonna flex up the neck and then you're gonna deliver following the pelvic curvature like that. So that's where my fingers are on the baby's face. And this is on the back so that we can flex the neck. And then you're going to put the baby right on mom's abdomen. So if you're nervous doing that delivery, you're like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because in, in, in our facility, in Prince George, you don't, you don't, uh, you wouldn't do vaginal deliver. breach delivery. So there's very strict um, criteria set up by the SOGC about facility to do a vaginal breach delivery. So when, because there's such high risk and um, so you have to have everybody in-house, not at home, everybody has to be here. Uh, anesthesia, the OR staff, the OB, uh, for you to do a vaginal breach delivery because the risk there is when the head gets trapped that's an emergency. And I just want to emphasize the reason why we keep saying to you is don't pull, is because if you pull on that, and you, what happens is the baby's head deflexes, and that's when you're more likely to get an entrapped head after the body's out. You want to always promote everything to so that the baby's head is flexed, like, because that's the smallest diameter that has to deliver. The other thing you can do to encourage that when you're delivering from the bottom is somebody can be at the top, a third, another person, over the pubic symphysis and putting some pressure there to cause the baby's neck to flex. That's critical too, so that it's the smallest diameter being delivered. So uh, I'm just wondering for us is uh, if we have a permanent delivery where there's a breach, then it's better on the transport. Okay. transport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you can, where are you? Are you uh, are you just <laughs> across the parking lot? <laughs> yeah, it's a tough. I mean, it's a tough call, but I would probably say uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll defer to the our expert. Well, I don't know. See, when I, for me, when we, the worst place to deliver is in transport. That's what I've always been taught, right? Because in the back of an ambulance. Uh, Right, so, and, and you can see that you need to, I forgot to say that, you know, she needs to be positioned off the edge so you've got room for that baby to dangle. You, if you can't put her in, in just on a flat surface, right? Oh, there's a lot of feedback if someone, are you, do you have a question to ask? Please, so, please mute. Like in everything we do, it's a judgment call. You have to decide when you're there. And if it's coming, I would say don't put her in the ambulance. You better just deliver it at home. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> you 
do have hospitals that can deliver. Yeah, they don't do any veg, any deliveries. So we, yeah, so we uh, transfer uh, people in labor. That's labor. It's a precipitous delivery, though, you, and, and you're close to Mackenzie, then you've got no, well, no choice. We've been on uh, to transport to here. Yeah. And they've done the same thing. Yeah. If there's someone in labor, I certainly would that would make sense. But I think there's a uh, this is this is usually with the um, the maternity transport advisors is the, the, the discussion of you know how dilated is the is the patient how how long have they been in labor uh, is this you know are they multip or nulliparous have they had babies before all of those factors take into account whether they'll be that likely be safe for transport, ground transport to Prince George. But if it's an imminent delivery, they'll deliver it in Mackenzie and, and wait for that delivery. Thank you for whoever muted. There's a lot of <laughs> feedback. Ah. Um. Yes, go ahead. KTH? Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah? So for those of us that are working, say, an hour and a half outside of a hospital and in the middle of nowhere, no ACPs, um, long helicopter rides, and we're presented with the breach delivery, what, and it just happens, what is something to consider when delivering a breach, if we have to, we have no choice, um, in the aftercare of the baby, the mortality rates, like... What is something to consider with real lack of resources and just an ambulance in an hour and a half away from hospital? What? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, if the, again, if the delivery is imminent, so you're, you've got that crowning that's happening, you've got, you're yeah. seeing the, the baby's bum, but it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's happening there. So you have to stay put and, and deliver that baby. I would, uh, you know, obviously, if you have cell coverage, I would encourage a call to EPOS. I would encourage, uh, if there are any uh, other uh, resources available, maybe they may not be nearby, but let's let's start to think about uh, an intercept or air resource that might be able to meet after the baby's delivered um, to assist. Because if 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 something happens, if they get obstructed, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be difficult. So I think. Um, your, your first question about whether to transport or not, I think if it's imminent delivery, then you have to deliver there. And then uh, I think a call to EPOS would be helpful in, uh, in, in helping you, walking you through the delivery. Because to be honest, I mean, if uh, a, a breach vaginal delivery for most obstetrician gynecologists outside of the, outside of BC Women's Hospital, maybe a few select tertiary hospitals, is unusual, right? It's 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 rare. Yeah, it's uncommon for us. I mean, most of those will either, you know, we'll have discussed with them either doing a version where we turn the baby or their planned C sections. But yeah, we we too have to be prepared if it happens, and you know, and it's coming. Um, that it's sometimes just faster to deliver it vaginally than it would be to run to the OR and do a C section. <laughs> you just hope that. That never happens. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any, because of the delivery would be different than, a crap, say, a normal delivery, if they are at risk for maybe um, like things like hypothermia, hypoxia, um, vital signs, if that changes at all, like if there's something to consider because of the, how they're delivered, if there is maybe increased risk of, you know, well, I, aspiration or something like that. Not really. They are it, have. They do tend to have poor, poorer tone, less tone. The the uh, breech uh, babies. Um, but in terms of nothing else really significant. Aren't they at higher risk for malformations, like certain malformations? Well, or? that's not going to affect what you do right there. No. Um, 
I mean, I think I'm just thinking, uh, not that being that familiar with it, the back of an ambulance, but I'm sure there isn't a lot of room. The important thing now, if you're going to do it in the ambulance, is keep it warm and get her position so her, her bum is at the edge of the stretch, I guess, so that you've got room for the baby to dangle. Like that position, so you've got room for the baby to come over the edge. Yeah. Unlike the lithotomy position on the on the on the mattress where there wasn't any any room below. But in terms of aftercare, when the baby's delivered, apart from expecting that the baby would have less tone than a, a, a vertex baby, I think your your steps and your resuscitation and care for the baby is the same. Regarding positioning at the edge of the cot. So if we are trying to actually do that, we're going to deliver out the back door because that's where that's where the edge of the bed is. So if we're trying to ensure the, um, the you know everybody stays nice and warm. Then we need to consider changing the entire position so that maybe we either turn her around and we can put the, the legs up a little bit, or we end up trying to put the actual attendance seat forward and move her backwards on the attendance seat. Um, but I think that's something that's worth some investigation, some, I don't know, some kind of uh, rehearsal just to see, okay, can we actually do this? Because, um, I mean, obviously we're talking about only a 1% chance that this is going to happen, but that's what we have to prepare for. And unless we have somebody actually go in and say, okay, look, this is the situation. We're going to move you back here so that we can get the baby to dangle. Tossing that out there for further discussion. I mean, obviously, you would have liked to anticipate that this, to avoid this happening in the back of the ambulance. I mean, if you were going to say, you know, you would have hopefully been able to say, okay, this is just going to happen. We better just stay where we are rather than go in the ambulance. But I agree, you have to talk about how you're going to do it if it happens in the back of an ambulance. Do a, a, do a you know, a, this is where a field simulation would be, uh, would be great to use, a, uh, like a doll like Noel. Um, to uh, to actually put in an ambulance and, and, and see how easy it is just to even to do a precipitous uh, uh, vertex delivery. Um, just to remind, is who's got their phone and uh, not on mute? Just check your phones, everyone. Just see if they're on mute. wondering as the controller of the call can you not just right click on them and mute it it looks like it's coming in from call and user four i don't think i can boys i'm calling in my it expert <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, another example of an obstetrical emergency. Um, fortunately, less than about 1% of vaginal deliveries, and this is kind of a more severe form of this. So, where's my... I need you to look in room one, Gail Gill. She's a sure nurse, she's a GP. Mm. Marvellous. Come on, push me out, Gail. <laughs> Baby's a shoulder dystocia. We tried uh, the McRoberts maneuver, but it's failed. Maybe no, yeah. they show it later. Oh, super pubic pressure isn't working. I'm gonna have to do an episiotomy. I got Okay, I'm gonna make a cut in your vagina. It's gonna help the baby come out. Yes. Quite realistic.
Thanks. Okay, we're just calling UBC to see if we can try and fix this because it's uh, it was a good it was a good video to to watch uh, to demonstrate a uh, shoulder dystocia. It's, uh, but we'll just carry on and see if they can see if it's can show it later. Yeah. Okay. okay. So shoulder dystocia. Um, so is uh, when the anterior shoulder can't be delivered. There's different definitions on it, but basically they get, the baby gets stuck uh, at, the, uh, at the perineum. The head gets stuck at the perineum. So the face comes out and, uh, and then it doesn't move beyond that. Um, and, and in terms of time, it's, it's like a prolonged head to body time, more than a minute. Um, risk factors, for shoulder dystocia, does uh, anybody anybody know? Big baby. Yeah, big baby will certainly put you at risk. Which a small mom? Yeah, I mean certainly, yeah, it would make sense. That's hard to predict, though. Um, gestational diabetes or diabetes will will. will often cause a baby to be larger than expected. Um, right? Post-term, yeah, Post -term. 41 weeks. With di diabetic babies, they're not, what's unique about them is they're not just big overall. They're, they have a, a tendency to distribute more fat around here. So, um, you know, you have big babies who are just big overall, but when they're big babies from moms whose pregnancies have been complicated by diabetes, they have a lot more here. And that's why they're at higher risk for shoulder dystocia. Yeah. And of course, uh, those those patients who deliver precipitously are also at risk for shoulder dystocia. So the patients that you're more likely to see are, are you have to expect this. Um, So the signs is the baby's head, they have a turtle sign, so the head kind of comes out and then it kind of gets sucked in. Uh, facial flushing. And I was hoping that it, the, the video was great at demonstrating that. So I'll see once we get, uh, if UBC can help us to, to show that. We'll come back to that. Um, as far as the management goes, um, there's a number of management techniques that can be used. Um, the external ones are these, the McBro McRoberts maneuver, which uh, is hyper, is flexing the hips, flexing the knees, and pushing pushing the legs back, and we'll show this in a video shortly. And then super pubic pressure as well on the side of the baby's back. And then of course, uh, trying to get any help you can, whether it's, uh, whether it means transporting the patient, if you, if you aren't able to deliver after uh, a few minutes, or, um, or uh, any assistance that might be available, other paramedics uh, or, or the wife. is really loud. We can't hear the video. We're on the side of the road. Okay, we're just uh, we're just waiting. UBC is going to cut them off. They're just they're, we're just on the phone with them. You want us to show? We'll carry. We'll just go to the next slides and we'll come back to this once we have better sound. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. So, complications of sh uh, shoulder dystocia. Um, oh, there we go. Yay. Yay. Oh. Yeah, that helped. Yep. That's awful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> hey, perfect. That's great. Thanks so much for your help. Okay, so Somebody can I go dialed us over, today? Uh, a shoulder dystocia? Okay. So 
So what you're going to notice is when the baby's head comes out, there will be a turtle sign where the head will be sucked up against the perineum. And that will tell you, that indicates that there's a possible or probable shoulder dystocia. is actually coming out OP, and when it comes out, it's going to externally rotate. All right, now the shoulders are stuck, so what we're going to do is I'm going to get McRoberts maneuver, we're going to flex up the hips quite a bit, and we're going to get some super pubic pressure, so we're going to put some pressure where that anterior shoulder is stuck to try and get it under the pubic symphysis. All right, you can either do that intermittent or constant. Now, that's not working for me, so another thing you can do is stop with the suprapubic. I'm going to try and deliver that posterior arm, and you can swing it up if you can. All right, that's not working. Let's try some suprapubic pressure again. It's not working. All right, so stop that for a minute. And what the other thing you could do is do the Woods corkscrew maneuver. You either rotate that anterior shoulder at 2 o'clock or at 10 o'clock, okay? And, and once you get it in that diameter, sometimes it'll get enough to get it under that pubic symphysis, and I can see that shoulder now has been dislodged, and we can now deliver the baby following again the pelvic curvature. What you don't want to do is be doing this and putting a lot of lateral traction on the baby's neck because you'll get a brachial plexus injury, and now we're going to just bring the baby up onto the mum's So I'm going to see if this video now will work, which is a bit more of a severe shoulder dystocia. No, doesn't look like it is. I need you to... It worked earlier. Any questions about the shoulder? Unfortunately, that video doesn't seem to be working. So... It was a little hard to see with the doll. When we, we talk about flexing the hips, are we basically going knees to ears kind of thing? Basically, almost to the point that you're lifting her bum off the bed. That's how flex you need to do. Because you, what, what you're doing is you're flattening out her lower back. Okay. And the pubic symphysis that's normally tipped slightly forward when she's on her back, when you flex her, it becomes a bit more vertical. So you allow more clearance under that uh, pubic symphysis for the shoulder. <coughs> The other thing when you're putting suprapubic pressure... You are now the host of this meeting. Ideally, you want to... The person that is on the side where the baby's back is is the one that should be doing the super. Ideally. Okay. In an emergency, and if you don't know where the back is, it doesn't matter. But what you're trying to do is put pressure on that anterior shoulder to dislodge it and get it under the pubic symphysis. And we're pushing down or down and out? You're pushing down and sort of out, yes. Any questions? Yeah, it's a general question, but applies to this for sure. Like kind of no one to hold them, no one to fold them. Like when do you just give up and get moving? It's when the head's out? Yeah. Mean? Like you, you had a you, shoulder dystocia, oh. like, it, like you, it's, or, or it's, it's, you can't, you got to get it out. Right. You have to get it out or the baby's going to die. And we've had that happen here. It's uh, in hospital. Uh, you have no choice. You can't, uh, you mean like, am I going to put her in the ambulance and go? No, yeah. the baby's going to die. Like my, my more general question was not just shoulder dystocia, but birth in general when mm -hmm. one's pushing. Uh, um, yeah, we don't have ability to monitor for any fetal distress or anything like that, right? So at, at what point do you kind of just have to get moving? It's a hard decision. I don't know how to make that, right? Yeah, I don't know if I can give a specific answer, but I think calling calling EPOS, discussing all the diff different issues, how far are you away from hospital, um, what, what resources are available, what other resources are available, um, all of those things I think would have to be taken into account. But um, if, you know, like if the definition of a shoulder dystocia is in, in this particular circumstance, I guess is more than a minute. So 
at what point, if you're at two minute, three minute, when do you decide it? You can't, you have to go, because they can't do an episiotomy. But, you, you know, shoulder dystocia is not a soft tissue problem. It's a bony problem. So you can cut as big an episiotomy as you want. That's not going to help you, right? So you're at home, and you're having difficulty with the shoulders, and and you're thinking, should I just get her in the ambulance and uh, and go? Uh, I I don't think so. I think you need to you need to do everything you can to deliver that baby, and um, because it's it's going to die if you put her in the ambulance. If you're a little aggressive and you're really pulling on that shoulder, not the head, but the shoulder, is there a chance you're going to dislocate the shoulder? Which may also help you. Yeah, well, we've broken the humerus, we've broken the clavicle. I mean, those are maneuvers that breaking the clavicle is actually a maneuver we do if you need to get it out. Um, but, of course, I know you guys aren't going to do that. And you know what? I mean, if you, if, you do, if you do do a brachial plexus injury, I mean, that compared to death, right? I just, I don't know what to say. You, you just, I don't think you have time. You can't put her in the ambulance with a head sticking out. You, by the time you get to the ambulance, before you get to the, the hospital, it's going to be dead. Okay. All right. And then talking about transport considerations for the patient in labor but not imminent delivery, um, we discussed this already about the closest center versus an obstetrical center. Uh, I think an EPOS call would be helpful uh, in making that decision. I think early notification as well to hospital that you're you're coming in, and uh, especially if you're going to be delivering to a emergency department um, rather than a labor and delivery room, because we are also not used to doing deliveries as well. So we're happy to have uh, that early, early notification, and then uh, you know in labor, uh, as we discussed, uh, and I can't remember when the rat when we did the rounds on the cardiac or maternal cardiac arrest, but keeping the baby off of the inferior vena cava um, by putting them in the, uh, putting a hip wedge in and, and putting them in, in the lateral decubitus position, left lateral decubitus, uh, will also help uh, maternal blood pressure, which will in turn help fetal uh, well-being. And uh, so uh, just just remembering to do those, those simple things. Um, One question. Yeah. So this is something that's kind of floated around and it's never been validated for me. Someone said antidiuretic hormone is similar to oxytocin. If you're dehydrated, it can put you into preterm labor and the fluid bowl as well. That is that is correct. They're both yeah secreted from the posterior pituitary, but you you rarely find women who are that dehydrated. You know, right? We I mean, oftentimes we see women who are coming in preterm labor and are knee jerk. Uh, is to give them fluids to try and see, and it's based on that principle. But 99 out of the women, if not 100%, they're not dehydrated. Um, and it's and there isn't actually even, you know, only in that scenario would it be helpful to give IV fluids. Good question. Um, I just had a question about IV fluid admin and what uh, permissive hypotension could relate to this. If we're giving fluids, should we restrict them if, as we've done for trauma just for oxygen carrying capacity and uh, coagulation and such in the case of just a precipitous delivery or, or postpartum hemorrhage or well i guess postpartum would be a bit different than pre-delivery if she's bleeding before maybe in the case of a partial privia we don't want to we're trying to keep her pressure up to perfuse the child but that could also um, harm coagulopathy and kind of playing that risk benefit, I guess. I, yeah, I don't think permissive hypotension in, uh, in maternal patients is necessarily advised, right? I don't think you need to worry about the coagulopathy risk in that scenario. She's bleeding uh, from a previa. I think you need to make sure she's got adequate pressure so you get adequate maternal uh, fetal perfusion. Is more the greater priority. Yeah. So, Phil, don't think you're you're okay to give give normal saline boluses. Yeah, we can absolutely. Do I just, okay, thank you. LOC radials or the pressure or. Well, you can't. Yeah, you can't monitor the fetal heart rate. So, 
um, as long as they're you know they're oxygenating okay, I think uh, you know you're 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 going to give it to them. They, I think both of those things are important. Um, I don't know if I'd you know I wouldn't give them necessarily. It depends on your transport time, but probably not more than a liter. Uh, these are Is usually. There a Pardon me, is there a, a target pressure we should be shooting to ensure fetal perfusion? Just like in what your normal targets would be. Okay. So, yeah, just what your normal targets would be. And these are young, I mean, usually this, this population are healthy young women. Um, it's rare that they have some kind of mm-hmm. cardiovascular uh, you know, disease or, or anything like that. I mean, these things do happen on occasion, but it's those are relatively rare and and usually um, disastrous. Usually, the most of the women are are healthy. So if you give them extra fluids, you're you're unlikely to cause any significant harm in that. You know, if you give them one or or two liters, you're unlikely to cause any significant harm, mm-hmm. um, you know, unless they're in fluid pulmonary edema for some you know, a, a reason they, they're, they've got a cardiomyopathy as a result of their pregnancy. But again, those are, those are going to be um, uh, less common, much less common. You can easily give them a liter or two and not have to worry about it. Um, and, you know, the, like, like you said, the, these are healthy reproductive age women and they can compensate a lot. And when they crash, that means they've probably lost two or three liters already. So, you know, they have the ability to compensate. So I think it's more important that you fluid resuscitate them um, appropriately so you have normal pressure so that baby's getting perfused. I don't want to complicate this, but the only scenario where I would think that fluid might be, you'd have to be careful with your fluids is in somebody who has severe preeclampsia, but that's not something you're going to have to deal with. And that's only because they're at higher risk for pulmonary edema in that, with that pathology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay, so just carrying on another case of female in labor, water broken, and you're doing the, the examination of the perineum, and you note that there's a cord hanging out, and I they didn't couldn't find any pictures of this uh, online, like an external view. So we got this kind of cross-sectional view, just showing what's what's happening there, and you know there can be there's also a cult prolapse where you don't actually see it outside of the perineum and so you would never know if that the baby's in distress uh, but but if the wa- if her water broke um, it's certainly something that's a concern that you should be thinking about could there be a cord there and um, and there's a mnemonic of course uh, for cord prolapse is cord so consider it at every exam of the vagina or the perineum in our in our in paramedics case you're examining the perineum uh, organize help, pre-notify. Um, you want to elevate, if uh, R is relieve pressure, so elevate the crowning head to try and relieve pressure off the cord. Avoid manipulating the cord, pulling on it. Um, use warm, if you're going to use gauze, a, a, a mo- warm, moist gauze. Um, the cold, any cold on there is going to cause vasospasm. Um, Encourage the patient into the left lateral position with the head down again to try and have the baby the baby's head move more towards the mother's head. So you're trying to kind of tip them up a bit and bring them bring the baby down away from the, the pelvis outlet um, and have a pillow. So you have a pillow placed under the left hip, um, or you can do the knee chest position. But obviously for transport, that's not going to really work. So um, you're probably gonna left lateral. I just, uh, sorry to interrupt, I have a question. Um, Logistically, in the ambulance, how are we to provide warm, moist gauze? If you can put that cord that you see coming out back in the vagina, then you don't have to worry about that gauze. But if if you can't, then yeah, ideally, that's what you want, uh, a gauze that's warm and moist. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if, if you have that available, if it's not available, um, you know, is sterile water, like if you're, if you're leaving a home and you've got, if you've got tap water, tap water that's warm, sure. is that reasonable? Is it, does it have to be sterile or can no. it be 
can it be just clean? Yeah, clean. So there's lots of, you know, water births that are done all the time. But you, you, don't, you don't do water births, but there are people that do do water births and babies are born in water. So mm -hmm. um, most of our tap water sources are relatively... Absolutely. It doesn't have to be sterile. Get some tap water, get a dishcloth, warm it up with, and then put it on the cord if you can't put the cord back in the vagina. But it, you just, you're just preventing it from getting too cold because it's going to vasospasm. Good question. And D, decision for birth, obviously, emergency transfer to hospital. Um, this is a, this would be a code pink in the hospital. So you, you'd try to arrange for immediate. This is where you'd put them in the ambulance and go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And there's just an example of the position that we're talking about to try and tilt the, ba the mom's body such that the baby floats down towards the head. All right, and in summary, so we, um, we talked about a number of obstetrical emergencies today. Um, we talked about precipitous deliveries, which will probably be the, the most common of those. We talked about uh, um, the collaborative uh, interactions with midwives and, and what their uh, scope of practice is. Um, we talked about postpartum hemorrhage treatment, the most common causes, um, breach presentation, shoulder dystocia, uh, prolapse cord, and, and also we talked about the transport considerations um, for transporting these these patients. I'll see if I can. Um, let's see. I don't know if I was I was really hoping to show that video, but I don't I don't think it's it's going to work. Um, but we do have time. We still have uh, twenty minutes. If if there are any questions, does anyone have any questions from the from the sites? It's Ron in Vancouver. Just one is that obviously with this province now being concerned with carfentanil and still fetal alcohol, how could any of these impact this delivery? Are there things that we should be cognizant of when embarking on trying to assist a woman with delivery? She may not even know she's pregnant in some of these cases. So these are all concerns that we'll have with, with a woman like that. Yeah, it's a good, good question, Ron. Um, and certainly... You know that 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 is a, a scenario which could happen. Is a, is they may be in they may not be aware of it, or they may be in denial about the pregnancy, and it may not be disclosed. And so, I guess uh, it should be in your differential of a of a any reproductive age woman with that um, that is having abdominal pain, or has having vaginal bleeding, or is having uh, any sort of discharge. Um, and that's where, you know, performing an abdominal exam and paying attention and being, uh, being aware that this is a, this is a potential possibility. It's more difficult when there's, you know, if there's, uh, uh, obesity or anything like that, where, where you may not be as apparent, but, uh, certainly putting your hand on the abdomen. And if you feel a firm mass in the, in the lower abdomen, having it as a consideration, and especially if those, it's a colicky pain that kind of comes and goes. Um, again, I, I think the treatment, as far as an opiate overdose, it doesn't, it wouldn't change a lot. There's certainly, you know, you, the, the maternal health is always takes priority. Um, and so you, you, if you didn't know that they were pregnant, you would, I think, treat them very similar to what, as you would any, any overdose. Um, I don't think your, your management is going to, going to, change a, a huge amount if, or if that suddenly disclosed that they're pregnant, I, you know, you, you good bag valve mask ventilation and, and Narcan um, are still going to be used. Uh, I have a question relating around uh, limb presentation and, and the complications in transporting that. Um, it's my understanding that a limb presentation requires an emergency C-section, and it's it's in, otherwise impossible to deliver uh, mm -hmm. vaginally. Um, as mentioned, my question relates around transport. Would you suggest a, a knee chest transport, obviously, to to a, a, uh, an emergency department, or is there a preferred way to transport a relatively rare condition like that? So you're talking about a scenario then where the fetus is in a transverse lie. 
And that's why you're getting a presenting part of an, an arm or a leg or an arm usually or a shoulder or something like that. I don't think you need, unless you're concerned about some, some cord compression and a cold cord prolapse or a full cord prolapse in that scenario, which is that is a scenario where it's higher risk if their membranes rupture and it's a transverse slide that the cord could uh, slip through. Uh, but if you're not concerned about cord compression or prolapse, in a transverse lie with a, uh, I don't think you necessarily need to put them in the lateral position. Uh, there would be no harm in transporting them that, in that position if you wanted to. The thought process being delaying delivery by in that position through gravity? Not really delaying delivery or relieving any pressure, um, uh, like in the, when there's a cord there. By putting them in that position, you're alleviating pressure um, over that area, over the cervix. Um, I have a question, but can you can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I recently had a baby, and when I was delivering, uh, her hips got stuck, and it was quite difficult actually to get her hips out um, and held up delivery for a little bit. What would you suggest, like, uh, how, how to deal with that in the field if that were to happen to us? I think it's fairly rare that that happens, but how would you deal with that in the field? So you had a cephalic, but baby was head down, right, when you delivered? Yeah, baby was yeah. head down. So the funny thing is we get such big babies now that we, we get body dystocia. You know, the head's out, the shoulders are out, and, and the, it's still sitting there. You can pull that baby out now. You okay, so it's okay baby. to pull on yeah, She was, there, she was like nine pounds, seven ounces, so yes. it's larger baby. That's what happened. It's a big yeah. baby. So you can just grab around the torso, and you can pull okay. the baby out. Okay, and there's you don't need to, like, try and, um, like, lift up or push down or anything? Well, just know, try follow, and pull? Follow, follow the, the curve? The head's out, the shoulders are out, the baby's just yeah. kind of sitting there, and, she's, and it's not moving very much. Just grab it around the torso, and just pull it out gently. Okay. Sometimes you have to a little harder because they're really big yeah but yeah you can safely do that okay perfect thank you so i was able to get the movie on do, does, do you guys want to watch we still have 15 minutes it's just a few minutes okay this is this is an example of a more severe shoulder dystocia so it's a bit alarming and frightening there's a bit of foul language it's an english show it's not it's not real it looks pretty real um i was surprised at the quality but uh here we go look in room one gail gail She's a nurse. He's a GP. Marvellous. Come on, push me now, Gail. Push! Come on. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. There's something wrong. Come on, push me, Gail. Push! What's happening? Push! Big push! Push, love. Big push! Shit! Shit! I never did much obstetrics. Hey, hey, you can't come in here. Please. Our baby's a shoulder dystocia. We tried uh, the McRoberts maneuver, but it's failed. Shit. Man, not... <laughs> oh, super pubic pressure isn't working. I'm going to have to do an episiotomy. Okay, I'm going to make a cut in your vagina. It's going to help the baby come out. Episiotomy <laughs> <laughs> oh, hasn't worked. Baby shoulders won't clear the pubic cut. Roberts has failed. I can't rotate the anterior shoulder. <laughs> shit, shit, it's jammed on the synthesis. We're going to have to try and deliver the posterior up. Baby's other shoulder is jammed on the base of your spine. I'm going to have to try and break your baby's collarbone to narrow his shoulders to squeeze him out. Okay, The fracture will heal, but I have to do this to get your baby out. Do you understand? I have to break the clavicle to deliver the arm. You're going to hear a crack now. It'll sound worse than it is. Shit, it won't come out. Shit! Look at the posterior arm. Jammed against the sink. Push! Push! I'm pushing! No, the shoulders are still stuck. Fuck. Oh, I can't. Shit. I can't. 
and we can't get him out. Do something, please, please do something. We can't get him out. We're going to have to get her to the theatre. I've never done it in my life. Me neither. Fuck it, let's go. We're going to push the baby back up and deliver him by cesarean section. Neither of us have done this procedure before, but it's the only chance to save your baby. Maya, call the peace and look after Dr. Gill. Nice. <laughs> Okay. Curve scissors. Uterus yet? Through now. Dines out. Come on. Get your hands on him. Oh. Okay, fundal pressure. That's a more severe form of uh, shoulder dystocia. Yeah, when you make doctors drop F-bombs, you've done something right here. <laughs> any, any other questions about this or any of the other topics we, we talked about today? Do you know statistically where, like I, I guess Fraser Coastal had said, is where most of our deliveries in BC ambulance happen? But is that, are, I guess, are they mostly metro? Are they mostly in ALS areas, or? Um, I didn't get, like, I, I, all I got was, yeah, Vancouver Coastal and then the north. I didn't get the interior, the island, or anything like that. I don't know. Do you guys have a better sense, Joe? I would imagine with the population. All the volumes happen in the population is, but often those transport times are so short in those areas that we tend to think of the hospitals as being still proportionate to the still where there's a higher population. Yeah. You know, in Alberta, I think you're in Alberta, um, First Nations communities are where we, we tend to do more delivery than culture. I don't know if that translates here. It's just yeah. that it probably does. Yeah. you think there's any role for the cheap little fetal Doppler to kind of monitor fetal distress and drive anything or not really? I, I don't know about how, you know, the the logistics of that, but I personally feel like that would be great to have as a tool to document, at least when you get on site, what what is happening with a baby? What's the status, at least with just a fetal heart? Is it done in other jurisdictions? Are there, are there I don't know. Fetal I just wonder, like, there, you, know, you can go to London Drugs and get a cheap one. I don't know what utility that actually provides. Yeah. Just yeah. It's... I, I mean, I, I guess uh, on our scenarios, I mean, it was, it was a precipitous delivery. I don't know if it would change that. You don't know how much you can do at that point. But a cord prolapse, you might uh, be able to, you know, if you get her in that position, you could then assess and say, okay, uh, what, what's my fetal heart now? Have I effectively alleviated pressure off that cord by putting her in this position? Because mm -hmm. I know you can't. What we do is we put our hand in the vagina and we push on that presenting part to alleviate pressure. And then we run to the OR. You obviously can't. I mean, we do that when we're running to the OR. Somebody's on the stretcher with the mom, alleviating pressure. Uh, and they're there until we, we get the baby out, their hands in the vagina. You guys can't do that. You, somebody's got to drive the ambulance. But at least you would know whether the position you put the patient in, in the ambulance, was enough to alleviate pressure that you have a feel heart rate that's normal. You would only know that if you have a doctor. Good point. And it isn't it. very expensive, a doctor. Point. Any other questions? Just want to thank Dr. Odulio for coming by today. And she's going to be uh, with us for the simulation, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you for everyone that, that came in. Sorry about the, uh, uh, the, the noise. Um, we'll try and uh, work on that for for next time obviously uh, uh calling in and getting that uh getting that discontinued as soon as possible okay have a good day everyone thank you thank you, thank you.